Hello everyone. What I would like to do now is talk about uh, multi-index notation, uh, the Schwartz space, and the relationship between the Schwartz space and the Fourier transform. So all of this is extremely important if you're going to study partial differential equations. Uh, for us, the Schwartz space is going to serve the purpose of just being a nice function space where basically things are well defined, okay? Um, which is largely what you do, uh, what, it's largely um, what you use the short space uh, for in partial differential equations. It's just a nice function space where everything is, is, is good and well defined and, and whatnot. Okay, so a multi-index is just an n-tuple of non-negative integers. So given x in r to the n, we can define x to the alpha to be the following real number. I just take x1 to the alpha 1 times x2 to the alpha 2 times all the way through xn to the alpha n. And an analogy to x to the alpha, we can define this partial differential operator formally. Um, we're just assuming f is nice, uh, and in some way, somehow, these derivatives make sense. So d to the alpha, if alpha is an n-tuple of non-negative integers, some people use notation partial to the alpha, partial x to the alpha. Um, then we define this to be well, first I differentiate with respect to x1 alpha 1 times. Then I differentiate with respect to x2 alpha 2 times. I keep going all the way to differentiating with respect to xn alpha n times. Now, if any of the alphas are zero, you just don't differentiate with that with respect to that uh, variable. And if alpha is just all zeros, then d, d0 is just f. D, D zero of F is just F itself. And um, in practice, uh, you don't care really what the order of differentiation is. It's just not gonna matter in practice. Um, so uh, not, yeah, it's not, not an issue. Um, you know, in practice, you can interchange the orders however you want, do whatever derivative you want first, uh, doesn't really matter. Okay, so the order of alpha is going to be just alpha 1 plus alpha 2 all the way add up plus alpha n. And that makes sense because, um, you know, if the order of d alpha f, I mean, the order of alpha is add up all these, and when you add up all these, that's exactly how many times you're differentiating with respect to some variable. Um, so yeah, the order of this differential operator is the order of the multi-index. Or again, the order of the differential operator has a standard meaning. It's how many times ultimately you're differentiating. Okay, so we have a partial order on multi-indices, which is very useful. Alpha is less than or equal to beta. Just means that for each i, or really I should probably do j, but whatever, because I, we, we do for the imaginary, but whatever. Each, um, each uh, element in my n-tuple is, uh, for alpha, is less than or equal to the corresponding element for beta, okay? Uh, we have the not concept of a factorial if alpha is bigger or equal to beta. That's alpha factorial over beta factorial, alpha minus beta factorial where alpha factorial is fairly naturally defined as alpha one factorial, this is a natural number or zero, times alpha two factorial all the way to times alpha n factorial. So when you do this here, because alpha is bigger or equal to beta, you're never going to take the factorial of a negative number. It could be zero, zero factorial is one, okay? <clears throat> all right, so, let me state a very elementary but important uh, property of multi-indices, which makes induction proofs using multi-indices very easy. And that is, if you have a multi-index of order k plus 1, k is some non-negative integer, 
then you can write d alpha as d alpha prime times some derivative. So there exists, exists j and there exists alpha prime where d alpha is d alpha, sorry, d alpha prime, this j derivative. And here alpha prime is of order k and alpha is alpha prime plus ej. ej is just the standard jth basis vector for um, r to the n. Uh, it's zero everywhere except in the jth spot. So nothing special about ej. Uh, and this also means if you think about it, that x to the alpha equals x to the alpha prime times x j. Okay, so let's prove this. So, um, right, so there's really two uh, cases. So let's go to the whiteboard. I'm going to prove it. It's very easy, but um, just in case you haven't seen multi index notation. Okay, so let's do the case uh, alpha one is not equal to zero. So alpha uh, that. So alpha is alpha one through alpha n. Alpha one is not equal to zero. So in this case, well, we do kind of the trivial thing. We just subtract one from alpha. And this is going to be a non-negative integer. Alpha one is positive. Alpha one is a non-negative integer and it's not zero. So it's got to be bigger than zero. So this is a non-negative integer. Could be zero. That's OK. Um, and everything else is the same. Okay, so uh, it's fairly trivial that this is going to be um, alpha one minus one plus alpha two. Well, this is obviously going to be add up all the alpha one through alpha n's minus one. Okay, so no issue. Uh, there. And let's just look at what the alpha is. Well, the alpha is just by definition going to be, do these derivatives last? Alpha n partial x and to the alpha n, do the n derivative last? Go all the way up to the um, x1 derivative. And then do, um, well, this, I mean, obviously this here um, is the same thing as, um, yeah, this is trivially d alpha uh, one over, or partial rather, um, x one alpha one. So, I mean, yeah, th this is trivial. I mean, this is just differentiating with respect to x one. Both of them are differentiating with respect to x1 alpha 1 times. Uh, so we'll get rid of that. And this is going to be equal to, well, this exactly is, um, by definition, d alpha prime. So here, j equals 1. And um, yeah, obviously, uh, you add. Um, Pretty trivial, but uh, alpha prime plus E1 is just alpha, where again, E1 is 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, all the way to n. Everything is 0 except um, alpha, except for the first one. Okay, uh, and if alpha 1 equals 0, um, it's not much harder. So let's write alpha to be. Um, uh, zero, which is alpha one, zero, uh, let's say um, alpha L. Okay, so all I'm doing here is this is going to be the first non zero spot. Certainly, L could be two. That's fine. All we know is L is bigger 
or equal to two. Alpha one, we're assuming is zero. Uh, sorry, spot. Okay. Um, right, so all we do now is say alpha prime and all of these up to, so this is the L minus one spot, uh, which really could be L minus one, could be one, but anyway. Um, yeah, so everything here is zero. So alpha prime is just, well, same thing. Just subtract one from the L spot and we don't even know or care what everything else is in the, uh, after alpha L, whatever. Uh, so basically, yeah, do the same thing. Um, I'm not gonna go through it, but by definition, um, well, actually, I guess I will uh, go through it. So first of all, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, sorry. I guess I'll go through it real quick. Uh, because all these are zero before the L spot, um, oops, sorry about that. So multi-index notation is kind of a pain in the ass, but um, really the power of it more than uh, compensates for how annoying it can be. Okay, so right. Um, so let me explain this uh, in one second. So where's all the derivatives before the L spot? Well, everything here is all zero. So you're taking everything, all these, you know, you're not taking any derivatives before the L spot because all these are zero. And remember when I said you have any of the uh, numbers in your multi-index being zero for this differential operator, d to the alpha, just means you don't differentiate there. So everything before the L spot is zero. We're not differentiating at all. So maybe I should make this, uh, guess I'll make this all J's, maybe a little, sorry about that. Um, oops. Alpha J, here's a J. Um, and this should be uh, J here. Sorry about that. And this should be a J here. Right, and so this takes care of uh, this case. Um, yeah, so this is gonna be fairly trivially equal to D alpha prime. So it's a you know, very trivial proof, but as we'll see in a second, it's very, or see in a little bit, it's very useful. And all the other properties are, yeah. Um, yeah. So just like before, um, it's fairly clear that this is going to be the same as alpha, but minus one, because everything's the same, except in the J spot, you subtract one. Um, and obviously, because alpha J is positive, it's a integer, non-zero non integer, non -neg sorry, it's a positive integer, alpha J minus one is a non-negative integer. Could be zero, that's okay. All right, so let's get back here. Okay, so something if you so desire um, to prove, you might wanna try it. Um, this is actually a homework in uh, kind of the gold standard of Graduate Partial Differential Equations books, Evans PDE, Lawrence Evans, excellent book. It's one of the first homework problems. So, um, and that's the Leibniz rule. It's, it's basically like uh, the product rule on steroids in some sense. Um, so if you have a multi-index alpha, d to the alpha of f times g is going to be this sum here. You're summing up over all beta less than or equal to alpha, um, I don't remember combinatorically how many beta that is. That really rarely matters. Um, you rarely have to do careful estimates knowing how many beta um, there are that are less than or equal to alpha. 
No, I mean, it wouldn't be surprising that maybe you do sometimes need to carefully know how many there are. So, um, but anyway, uh, alpha. So it's basically like the, uh, the almost very similar to, um, I guess, binomial rule in some sense. Um, but anyway, so it's alpha, um, alpha choose beta, d beta f, d alpha minus beta g. Okay. And again, uh, the way you would prove this, well, I didn't mention it, but um, yeah, but if you want to do this for homework, you can do this for homework. I don't know. If, I doubt I'll collect it. Um, and the way you would prove it is exactly what's uh, here. You, you would exactly just do induction on the degree, or rather the order of your multi-index. You prove this for all um, multi-indices of order k, and then you prove it for indices of multi, um, all multi-indices of order k plus one by this kind of silly but useful decomposition here. Okay, so enough of that. Let's get to the short space. And I'll actually do um, an inductive proof uh, using what I have here. Um, just to give you uh, practice for doing it if you've never seen it before. Okay, so the short space is a set of all C infinity functions. That just means F and every derivative possible of f exists and thus is continuous on Rn, where basically the L infinity norm of x to the alpha times this d beta f is positive for any alpha and beta uh, multi-indices whatsoever. Now there's no uniformity in alpha and beta and typically as the elements uh, of alpha and the elements of beta get larger and larger and larger. Typically, this quantity here blows up, but we don't care as long as for each alpha and beta this is finite, then it's in a short space. Okay, so what does that really mean? It's very easy uh, to show because this is true for any alpha at all, no matter how large the elements of alpha are. It's very easy to show, and I'll leave this as an easy homework, that each, any partial derivatives of f decay faster than modulus x to the k for any k that's a natural number, okay? So you have faster than one over modulus x to the k decay for any integer, any natural number k. So that's really what's going on in the short space. Okay, so this is for any f in a short space, uh, any beta, that's a multi-index, and any k. And again, there's no uniformity here. As k gets larger and larger, and as beta, the elements of beta get larger and larger, typically you have to go farther and farther out to, you know, to, for this whole thing to be small, but that's okay. Just for any fixed f, beta, and k, this limit is, if we're, in a, if we're in a short space, then this is true. Okay, so a very simple example of an element in a short space, if you so desire to check this, um, can, is e to the minus modulus x squared. Um, yeah, just uh, basically by induction, um, uh, you, you can, or, or just, just an ugly calculation using the Leibniz rule. Um, well, you don't, probably don't need the Leibniz rule. Um, it, it's kind of an ugly calculation. Take all these derivatives. Um, but anyway, you, you can prove that it's in a short space. It's not too bad. Um, also, any function with that C infinity with compact support is fairly trivially in the short space. A kind of interesting example, maybe not super interesting, but an example that's not in the short space, even though you have exponential, very strong exponential decay, is this function here. And the reason, very simply, let's call this F, 
So smooth and exponential decay is not enough to be in the short space. Well, it's pretty easy to see that you differentiate uh, the sine uh, e to the x squared to get e to the, uh, I'm sorry, get 2x e to the x squared sine e to the x squared uh, plus uh, 2x, um, rather, minus 2x. I mean, it really doesn't matter what this is. You could, well, I guess it kind of does, but anyway, minus x squared sine e to the x squared. Okay, so sorry about that. Okay, so here you can see that the e to the minus x squared cancels with the e to the x squared. So you have 2x sine e to the x squared, and that obviously actually can blow up for large x. Okay, so certainly um, even just one derivative you don't, you, you, this is not bounded, okay? So, um, yeah. And this, of course, no matter what x is, as long as it's large, goes to zero. Um, but anyway. Okay, so, um, yeah, let's talk about a metric on the short space. And this is, I mean, it's kind of interesting. Um, so you're kind of in a similar spot as you are in complex analysis when you have an open subset of the complex plane and you want a metric to describe convergence of a sequence of holomorphic functions um, to a holomorphic function, not on all of this open set, but on compact subsets of uh, this open set. And you need some kind of funky metric like this to do it. So, Let's say we enumerate uh, pairs of multi-indices. So obviously it's countable, um, this product here. It's fairly trivially you know, countable. So we can enumerate all pairs of multi-indices. And we define the, for two Schwartz space functions, f and g, d of f, g, this distance function, is the sum here, two to the minus k, over this whole thing here. Um, and more generally, if you've taken functional analysis, perhaps with Professor Yang, uh, I think, I know, I'm pretty sure he's fond of doing Frechet spaces and locally convex spaces. Um, so he might have seen this before, uh, but if not, that's okay. The whole idea here is very simply that this is a metric space. D is a genuine metric. Um, and I should also say P alpha K beta K. Well, P alpha beta is just this here. It's literally this supremum or this L infinity norm right here. Um, right, so what's the point here? The point is, and this is for homework. Um, I remember if you've taken my complex analysis, I actually gave a very similar homework. Um, saying like you have a, if you have a funky metric like this, very similar to this, um, then you have convergence in that metric um, for a sequence of holomorphic functions on an open set, uh, if and only if uh, that sequence converges on every compact subset of your open set. So here FM converges to F in the short space under this metric D, Precisely when each of these go to zero for any alpha, any pair of multi indices alpha and beta. Uh, I have no idea why I have. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's fine. Um, uh, actually, yeah, sorry, this should be a uh, n here. No idea why I have k, but that's all right. Yeah, so for any pair, yeah, anyway. Yeah, and this is a fairly. It's not too bad of a homework. And the key here is that this whole quantity here that I'm circling, regardless of what it is, I mean, it, this is an actual number. This is a positive number. The, by, by definition, each of these are finite. So for each K, 
this is going to be between uh, zero, I guess it could strictly be, well, sorry, it can't be, uh, it could theoretically be zero. Um, but strictly between, it's, it's strictly smaller than one. So, um, yeah, anyway, so it's not a, not a bad homework. I'll probably collect it because it's, yeah, you need to define um, metrics like this. As I mentioned, in complex analysis, it's very natural. And in other contexts, it's very natural. So it's a good homework to do. Okay, so I want to make a very elementary but extremely useful comment in that if F is in a short space, then X to the alpha for any multi-index alpha times F of X is also in the short space. Not a very deep statement. It's basically trivial because this is true for every alpha whatsoever. This is true for all multi-indices alpha. And here we're just saying this is, you know, here we're fixing an alpha. So it's, it's literally by definition. Okay. Okay, so let's state a lemma uh, about um, uh, the Fourier transform and uh, multi-index notation and these differential operators. So you can state this for more general functions than short spaces, but in practice, you really only care about short space functions um, because in, in most function spaces that are useful in PDE, like LP spaces or Sobolev spaces, um, you almost always have the short space is dense in um, your function space. So you, you often just care about these properties for short space functions. All right, so anyway, so the Fourier transform of this derivative here is going to be two pi i to the order of alpha times x to the alpha f hat of x. And I'll actually prove this carefully. Um, we did this already in one dimension, so uh, it's just integration by parts. So for us, what's kind of the, the point of proving this is getting used to an inductive proof with multi-indices. Um, B will be for homework, uh, d alpha f hat. You differentiate the Fourier transform and you get minus two pi i to the order of alpha times the Fourier transform of this right here. Okay, um, so I'll make more of a comment on this in a second. And the same is true for the inverse Fourier transform, but there's no minus in B. So this is a minus sign here, it's not clear. Uh, maybe I'll make this a little clearer and put a minus sign here. And this is alpha right here. And that's not surprising because the inverse Fourier transform, remember, is literally the same thing except, well, plop in minus x. Okay, right. So I first want to, well, I'm going to prove that the Fourier transform is actually a bijection on the short space. Okay, and this is extremely useful in PDE theory. Uh, you have, we already talked a little bit about uh, formally using the Fourier transform to prove facts, to, to prove uh, statements and, and to analyze partial differential equations. And we actually um, did that for, I think, not the wave equation, but Kirchhoff's equation. Um, and we actually used it to solve that this very practical, very useful PD uh, in terms of the Fourier transform. Okay, so this is saying that uh, as long as we're dealing with nice functions, we take the Fourier transform, we still are dealing with very nice functions where everything is nice, decay, fast decay, all derivatives exist, no issues with anything really, okay? Okay, so what's the proof? Well, first of all, B actually says the Fourier transform is C infinity. So first of all, when I say D alpha, let's go back to the definition. Um, actually, this is one of these cases where order doesn't matter whatsoever. Really, 
you can differentiate in any order you want. And uh, as we'll see, or actually as for homework, you'll see, you're gonna get the same thing here. So all derivatives of um, the Fourier transform are going to exist. And in particular, all derivatives of the Fourier transform are at least L infinity because this function here um, is definitely going to be an L1. That's really trivial from this homework right here for large enough K. Okay. Um, yeah, so K here could be anything. So use this fact for large enough K where alpha is fixed. And you'll get for this fixed alpha that X to the alpha, well, sorry. Um, well, it is in the short space. It, it's, it is an L1. Um, so, yeah. Or you can just use the fact that the short space is contained in L1, which is basically um, also proved by um, this fact here. But anyway, so however, you know, it's very easy, very elementary fact. Okay, and that means that this whole thing here is an L infinity function because, um, you know, we, we know, just for all to remind you, um, that what's, what is a Fourier transform? Well, it's just this uh, f of u e to the minus 2 pi i x dot u du smashing absolute values. Uh, f of u to u, and this is the L1 norm. So the Fourier, so the um, L infinity norm of this right hand side here is less than or equal to the L1 norm of x to the alpha f, and that is finite. So all derivatives of all orders exist and are in L infinity. Okay. All right. So um, let's finish up the proof here. Well, it's very easy by A and B. So let me get rid of this. This is getting a little crowded here. Um, but Okay. Um, yeah, these, this eraser is kind of a not so great for Adobe Reader. But anyway, uh, there we go. And uh, I guess I'll leave everything else here. Uh, okay, anyway, so let's, uh, so what do we need to do? We need to prove that if I take the L infinity norm of each of these, I get P alpha beta. So I need to show that each of these has finite L infinity norm. Okay, so first of all, I know what D beta F hat is. Well, instead of beta, instead of alpha, let's put beta here. So it's just minus two pi i to the order of beta um, times the Fourier transform of this function. And, and I should say, if there's any confusion at all, shouldn't be with this notation. But what this means is I'm just taking the Fourier transform of the function x to the alpha f of x. So this is just by definition going to be uh, u to the alpha f of u, uh, e to the minus two pi i x dot u du. So yeah, that's all this means. Um, so, okay, let me get rid of that then. Okay, so, uh, right. Let us uh, use this. So by B, this quantity here is going to be the I goes away because we're taking, or I guess I should put modulus here. Or uh, actually, let's not do modulus, not that it matters. So let me stick an I here. Okay, so it's X to the alpha times this Fourier transform. The X to the alpha just comes along for the ride, but by A, I can compute X to the alpha times the Fourier transform. 
it's just the Fourier transform of the derivative with respect to alpha. Okay, so using A here, I get this following here. So this to this was B, this to this is A. Okay, and I mentioned that, so there's nothing, it's fine here because as I mentioned, this is in the short space. Okay. U to the beta f of u is a short space function if f is. So I can do b. Sorry, I can do a. I can do a to go from here to here. So yeah, this is by b and this is by a. Okay, but Let's just do this. So, so what, what does this tell us? This tells us that this um, P alpha beta of F hat by definition is this L infinity norm. And this is gonna be the L infinity norm of this quantity here, as we just saw and as we've done many times before, this is less than or equal to the L1 norm of this quantity here. And again, you can check, it's a bit of a pain using the um, uh, Leibniz rule. Yeah, using this Leibniz rule here, but you can check that because we're dealing with a short space function, um, this whole thing here is an L1 for alpha, beta, um, fixed okay and again it's, it's really fairly trivial uh it's really just an application of um this fact right here that you use over and over and over again just you know for alpha and beta fixed you just pick k large enough and that basically proves it um Right, so that implies, because each one of these is finite, that implies that this is in the short space, okay? The exact same proof, literally the exact same proof, says that the inverse Fourier transform is in the short space if F is in the short space. Well, the short space is contained in any LP whatsoever, again, by the fact that I had, that you have decay faster than uh, one over modulus, one over absolute value of x to the k as x goes to infinity for any k. That tells you that the short space is contained in any LP of Rn for any p whatsoever, in particular L1 intersect L2. So we have Fourier inversion. And so that means that as a map from the short space to the short space, the inverse is the inverse Fourier transform, okay? So this is a bijection on the short space. What is more, and I'm gonna leave this for homework because the proof is virtually the same as what I did here. What's more is that this is a homeomorphism on the short space. So in particular, F, sorry, the Fourier transform and its inverse is continuous in the short space in the sense that fm goes to f in this metric space if and only if fm hat goes to f hat in this metric space. Again, that's an easy homework, so I won't go over it. So I want to finish up with a proof of A using induction. So I'm going to prove this here using, I'm going to prove this using induction. Okay, so first thing to notice is that um, let's do induction on the order of um, my multi index. So let's start with order zero. Well, there's literally nothing to prove here if alpha is all zeros. D all zeros is just F. 2 pi i to the 0 is 1. x1 to the 0 times x2 to the 0 times xn to the 0 all the way, go all the way to xn. 
that's all going to be one. So all when alpha equals zero is or when when the order of alpha is zero. So all the alphas are zero. This is just saying f hat equals f hat. So it's literally not saying anything. So it's trivially true for alpha. Um, the order of alpha being zero. So now let's assume it's true for the order of any multi-index being k and any Schwartz space function f. So I did get a new phone, so hopefully the camera is a little better and light. Um, so anyway, well, this is obviously R to the N. Okay, so right. So let's assume now that I have some multi-index with order K plus one and let's write D alpha as D alpha prime times this derivative, this first order partial derivative where the um, order of alpha prime is the order of alpha um, minus one. So that's equal to uh, K. Okay. Okay, so just, um, well, you know, Fourier transform of D alpha F is this Fourier transform because D alpha F is the alpha prime times, or D alpha prime applied to this partial derivative. Okay, but I know by my inductive hypothesis that this is true, I'm trying to prove for all multi-indices of order K. Okay. So just apply that. It's, it's two pi I to the order of alpha prime, X to the alpha prime times this, um, Fourier transform. And now let's assume I can prove that these two, and this does require proof. I'm not saying it's absolutely trivial. I mean, it's easy, but it's not trivial. Um, really, I mean, we did it already. It's just, it's an annoying exercise and notation, really. But let's assume that this is true, that the Fourier transform of this partial derivative um, is uh, this right here, okay? Um, so um, now I should say alternatively, if you wanna start off with um, multi-indices of order one, you can do that. Um, you can't just assume by inductive hypothesis that this is true, really, um, because we really didn't even prove this is true for order one derivatives. So we gotta prove it, but that's all right. So assuming this is true, well, uh, yeah, so assuming that these two are equal, well, multiply these two together. I mentioned before, let's go back a second. And this is why I mentioned it, because it's useful that x to the alpha is x to the alpha prime xj, okay? So that's just x to the alpha. Um, uh, sorry, so um, not quite correct what I was saying. So, um, so really this is going to be this whole thing times two pi i, um, or rather, um, yeah, so forget about this here. So let's assume that these two are gonna be equal. So then I'll put the two pi i over here. So that's alpha prime order plus one. That gives you two pi i to the order of alpha, and then x to the alpha f hat, and that's exactly what we want to prove, assuming it's true for order k uh, derivatives. So we just need to prove 
uh, what I we just need to prove um, that these two um, that what I have here is going to be two pi i times this whole thing here. That's what I need to prove. Okay. Right, and like I said, this is easy uh, integration by parts. We've essentially done this already in one dimension. So by definition, uh, usual for, uh, partial derivative notation, for a transform of this partial derivative is just this here. Uh, and of course, this is going to be e to the minus two pi i times the sum here. L equals one to the n um, x l u l. This is l's here. So it's x to the l u to the l. All right, so write that as a product of these exponentials. And particularly, let's uh, isolate out l not equal to j and l equal to j. Okay. So, and also using Fubini's theorem, everything is nice in L1. This whole thing here is L1. So you can integrate whatever order you want. So let's in particular integrate over R to the N minus one over all these other variables. That's what U tilde is. It's basically, this just means integrating over all these N minus one variables other than um, J. And let's do, uh, in the inside, the j integration for, for xj. And by dominate convergence theorem, because everything is L1, I can write this as the limit of this integral from minus r to r. So when I write it as a product, this whole thing here obviously is a constant with respect to uj. And all we're left with, is, left with here is this e to the minus two pi i xj uj times this partial derivative. So we're just getting back to calc one here. This here is going to be, well, maybe I'll do the whole thing. So this here, you obviously want to be your dv. This here is uh, maybe u is, I mean, well, whatever, shouldn't cause any. Uh, concern here. So du is minus 2 pi i um, uh, xj times e to the minus 2 pi i xj uj. And v is just f of u. You just integrate with respect to uj. You integrate the partial derivative, you just get f back. Anyway, you do the partial, uh, you do the integration by parts and um, the boundary term, because we're dealing with a short space function, that's going to go to zero, no issue there. And the minus sign you get from integration by parts gets rid of this minus here. So, right, from taking du, you get the 2 pi i xj. Otherwise, it's, um, yeah, you get the 2 pi i xj, pull that out. And then it's just f of u e to the minus two pi i x j u j here. And then you still have this product here. Well, just now it's kind of trivial. Um, so combine everything up into one product, bring everything inside, uh, make this again, through Fubini's theorem, just an ordinary integration over Rn. Um, write the product as e to the minus 2 pi i times this dot product. And this is 2 pi i xj f hat of u. Okay. So, um, right, that's exactly what we needed to prove. Okay. Um, so, b is going to be similar. You need dominate convergence for b, but it's a similar um, induction. So, um, right. Um, all right, so hopefully that was uh, helpful. Uh, hopefully you found that interesting. Um, so we'll go a little faster, uh, put more videos up with more speed uh, in the future. Uh, if there's any questions, let me know. Um, do give me homework three sometime in the next week or two and I will assign new homework 
probably next week. I'll grade your homework soon. Um, all right, so long. Take care. Uh, until next time.